Welcome to part seven of lecture three of bluff body aerodynamics. So here's a sketch that allows us to see how polyhedral cells efficiently fill space. So on the left, we see a uh, 2D grid made up of triangular cells. And on the right, we see sort of over set on that uh, in red, a, a six sided polygon that has the same edge size, but one sixth as many cells. So we can see that polyhedral cells are very efficient. And this is what will be used in the meshes you'll be generating um, for your SimScale uh, lab throughout this course. So here's some general grid generation guidelines. You need finer resolution in regions where there are higher gradients of velocity or pressure. You need to satisfy the Y plus requirements of your turbulence model, and this can be an iterative process. You don't really know if you've satisfied the Y plus requirements until you've got your answer. You need to have enough cells within the boundary layers, usually around 10 is a good number. And far away from the object of interest um, in an external flow simulation, the grid can become quite coarse without there really being any problems because the gradients are very small there. Another important thing to think about is choosing the size of your computational domain. So the idea here is that for an external flow, the boundary conditions should not affect the flow around the vehicle. In practice, this means that the flow boundary should be at least three vehicle lengths or whatever the largest of its length scales are away from all sides of the vehicle. Rigorously, after one obtains a solution, one should enlarge the computational domain and then check whether any of the quantities of interest change. But uh, that's in practice, perhaps not often done. The generation of unstructured grids uh, in modern software is largely automated. So an example of this is Snappy Hex Mesh, which is an unstructured polyhedral mesh generator in OpenFoam, and this is used in SimScale. And I'll demonstrate this uh, in an example of using SimScale later today. We also have to specify boundary conditions before we can run the solver. Right? The computational domain does not extend to infinity, so we need to apply boundary conditions all at all of its edges. At walls, typically we would apply a no-slip boundary, um, which basically means that the fluid velocity equals the wall velocity. The wall could be stationary or the wall could be moving, depending on the application. At inlets, in incompressible flow, we normally specify the velocity, or it's also possible to specify the total pressure and the direction of the velocity. At outlets, we normally specify the static pressure, or perhaps the flow rate that we want. And we can also have openings or inlet-outlet boundaries, where we specify two sets of conditions um, for either inlet or outlet flow, depending on whether the flow ends up entering or leaving the domain there, so a bit more flexible when we have boundaries where it's not clear which will be happening. And then the solution at a given time, um, or the solution if it's a time invariant uh, problem, is determined via iteration. Um, basically, directly solving the equations for all the cells at once is not practical. So instead, we use iterative methods that are gradually used to sort of hone in on the correct velocity, pressure, and turbulence quantity fields that satisfy the governing equations and the boundary conditions together. So one way to think about this is that uh, at each iteration, the difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand sides of each equation is something that we call the residual. We ideally want that to go to zero. And one way to check how well a computation is converging or getting close to being finished is to ensure those residuals drop by several orders of magnitude. We can control the stability of our solution with something called under-relaxation. Basically, if the changes are too large from one iteration to the next, the solution process can be unstable and can diverge and basically yield garbage. Uh, the residuals get larger, the flow field becomes completely meaningless. To prevent this, we use under-relaxation. Basically, we restrict the amount by which the flow fields can change from one iteration to the next. So, for example, um, if we have uh, under-relaxation factors, we, the new value, say a pressure, will be the previous value plus the sort of delta p, uh, the change that's supposed to be imposed, but this parameter alpha is a number less than one. And similar approaches are used for the velocity fields. So this means it takes more iterations, but the solution is stable. So again, a balance here um, between if you have these parameters set too high, it'll take a very large number of iterations to get to a solution. If they're set too low, the solution will be unstable and you won't get an answer at all. <coughs> 